Infections caused by multidrug resistance Pseudomonas aeruginosa are considered a major public health problem and very difficult infections to treat in clinical settings. And this is because antibiotic options are really scarce, um, but new drugs are emerging and more may be available in the na- near future. So today we will discuss this important topic with experts in the field and welcome to Editors in Conversation. The objectives of this podcast is to discuss Pseudomonas aeruginosa as an important pathogen capable of developing resistance to multiple antibiotics, elaborate on common mechanisms of resistance of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and deliberate on the, currently, uh, the current and future approaches to treat these very difficult infections uh, uh, caused by multidrug-resistant organisms. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy Journal, available at aac.asm.org. I am your host, Cesar Arias, Editor-in-Chief of AAC, and this podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes AAC. Joining us in the podcast uh, to discuss this important topic and is Dr. Mike Satlin, who is Associate Professor of Medicine, Pathology, and Laboratory Medicine and the William Randall Hurst Foundation Clinical Scholar in Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at Well Cornell Medical College in New York, um, New York City. And Professor Alessandra Caratoli, who is professor of, at the Sapienza University of Rome, Italy, and she is one of the proud editors of Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy. Welcome to the program, uh, guys. Thank you for accepting our invitation. So we're going to discuss today Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and I want to start with Alessandra to put this in, uh, in context. So why these organisms are, are so resistant and so difficult to treat? So from the biological point of view, what are the highlights you could give us about these organisms? Pseudomonas aeruginosa, in fact, can be considered a superbug. Why we are so interested in studying this organism? First, because uh, uh, it has a peculiar um, intrinsic resistance to several drugs, just because of the structure of the bacterium, and because it has a, a low uh, permeability in the outer membrane. It's a gram net, it has this outer membrane, but differently by other uh, gram nets and differently by enterobacteria. So the monocyte has some uh, uh, different, has not a normal porins that normally diffuse nutrients and also antibiotics within the cell. And it, it, it works with the specialized channels that import specific nutrients. And this limitation of, of the porosity and the permeability of the, of the outer membrane is one of the most uh, peculiar things. The other, I think we can say, is the fact that it can colonize many different environments, the water, uh, infecting humans, yes, but also animals, and it survives in, 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 different, in different places of the rhizosphere. And uh, it can cause both acute infections, but more importantly, chronic infections. And there is a transition between the, the pathogens that uh, enter into the organism causing the acute infections and that one that is stabilizing the chronic infections. There is a, a peculiar phase that we call pathoadaptation in which Sodomonas lost, uh, um, lost the, um, um, the structure that stimulates the immune systems. And by this way, it ev- evades the immune systems. For instance, it changes the phase. It, it, uh, it's able to switch off the flagella production and the other PD structures. And also it's uh, uh, presenting modifications important in the uh, O antigen in, in the in the external uh, immuno, immunogenic uh, uh, properties changes substantially, and it starts to produce uh, a sort of polysaccharides, and this is more one important point because it goes through uh, a, a phase of aggregation that protects the cells from antibiotics. And these cells are in a dormant state, they persist. They are not really um, dividing cells, active cells. In this state, it's very, very dangerous because despite we can isolate cells, they are not resistant, formally resistant to antimicrobials. In that state, they are 
and they persist and continuing the, the therapies and, and the, the cycle of therapies in chronic infections are, are, are abundant, at the end it becomes resistant, frankly resistant. It accumulates mutations, he has the time to do that. So if you sum the, uh, the uh, fact that it's intrinsic, resistant to many antibiotics at, at, at uh, uh, low MICs, but they, they do not enter the optimum brain with the same facilities than in other parts. If you consider that he's able to do acute chronic infection, he continues to stay uh, many years within the patient. During this stay, he's allowed, he's dormant sometimes, so the, the antibiotics acting on, on the uh, uh, dividing cells uh, don't, don't work, but in the same time, it can accumulate mutations, and we see how eventually we can go in deep in this part. I think. These are, yeah. for me, this is the description of this bug, respect to the others, at least. Excellent. And I want to go back to that first phrase that you say is a true superbug, very rugged, very well evolved sort of environmental organisms that can colonize humans. So, uh, Dr. Sattlin, you know, you are very used to see patients, immunocompromised patients. So what are the clinical settings in which we expect this recalcitrant pseudomonas infection that are multi drug resistant? Yeah, I think a, a lot of those characteristics that were described kind of create this environment for pseudomonas to sort of prey on certain types of patients. And the first group I think of or uh, that I see clinically are patients who are in the intensive care unit, particularly those on a ventilator, where Pseudomonas aeruginosa can quickly colonize the respiratory tract. And based on some of the characteristics that Dr. Caratoli discussed, it can stay on the, uh, on the endotracheal tube. It can stay in a, a variety of catheters that are uh, lining these patients. And p these patients are at high risk of developing pneumonia due to Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And an ammonia that might be able to be treated, but then may come back and come back even more resistant due to some of the characteristics discussed. Um, number two, I'd say, would be more chronic infections. And these are patients with chronic lung disease, like bronchiectasis, for example, cystic fibrosis patients, where pseudomonas can really become very mucoid, colonize these respiratory tracts, and become very difficult to get rid of, despite repeated exposures to antibiotics. Third one I would say would be our neutropenic patients. So patients who have received chemotherapy uh, become neutropenic where pseudomonas is a really nasty pathogen when we see it in those types of patients. Um, and in fact, most of our empirical therapies that we give for patients with fever neutropenia, uh, you know, it, it's um, revolve around making sure we're treating pseudomonas aeruginosa. So all the drugs we use, you know, those are drugs that have at least intrinsic activity against pseudomonas. And the last one I, where I see it is uh, in burn patients. You know, our skin is such an important part of our innate immune systems, and particularly some of these chronic infections. You know, pseudomonas will easily prey when we lose that important component of our innate immune system. So those are, you know, pseudomonas can cause all types of infections and all types of patients, but those are the four main areas where I, I, I see this as a major clinical problem. Absolutely. Um, couldn't agree more. Uh, Alessandra, go, go, let's go back to these characteristics of these organisms. Um, there, is, uh, there are several uh, descriptions in the literature about this hypermutator phenotype. I know you are an expert on, on, on this genomics in transposable elements and plasmids. Um, tell us how, 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 how that ability, that genomic plasticity of pseudomonas can affect these this, uh, phenotypes of resistance. Okay, we have this instrument which is particularly precious now that is the whole genome sequencing, right? And what can we do with this, with this instrument? First, uh, you can do provision and uh, cultivating uh, cells in vitro, and uh, you can uh, observe the evolution in vitro, and you can predict which uh, kind of uh, mutation you can expect. But what happens in vitro sometimes doesn't correspond to what uh, you see in vivo. And however, we learn a lot of, of mechanisms, and in particular for uh, pseudomonas, I should say that 
there is a, an important variability in the amount of the genome. Uh, we have pseudomonas strains with 5.5 million best pairs, and, but we have also pseudomonas with 7 million best pairs. This, is, this means that we have a lot of flexible genomes and a small core genome. What does it mean is that there is a big difference uh, between different strains first, okay? And this, this is not only um, between strains, but even strain, the same strain can evolve. And there is a, again a, a correlation with the evolution of the, of the infection because the, the genome also uh, um, uh, acquires uh, several uh, differences. And uh, there, there is, for instance, the description of these dormant cells that in fact uh, are um, uh, aggregated in small populations. This has been described in recently. Uh, in, there is a cell report which uh, described the uh, sinuses uh, um, of uh, cystic fibrosis patients that are colonized by different strains, in fact, than the others. So, so you have in the same organism, you can have the impression that you have multiple pseudomonas strains. Is that is the same? that is drifted and is evolved uh, genetically in different ways. So you, uh, you have mostly um, uh, mutations that accumulate, so nucleotide substitutions, so all things that we can see. And under selection with antibiotics, you evolve one population on the others that has this characteristic that fit with this selection. And then there are also evolution to mutagenesis of genes uh, that are implied in mismatch repair, like MUT, LS. Uh, these mutations in, in, increases the frequency of mutations more because the, the mutation of the mismatch repair means that you do not repair anymore the mismatches. And therefore, after that, you can really see a lot of, uh, of mutations that are accumulating. And of course, more it, it more, more it persists, more it arises to find a, a mutation that could be helpful under selection. And, and finally, you have the mobile elements. There is a moment in which it has been described that, that the uh, population um, um, has a particular arrangement and the genome thanks to the activation of several insertion sequences and, and also uh, genes that were uh, switched off are uh, starting to be expressed. So there is also not only mutation, but regulation of transcription that impact on, uh, on the phenotype that we observe. So really by world genome sequencing, we can follow up. Uh, the best is to follow the pairs, to sequence the pairs of isolates from the same patient before, during the therapy, uh, after the therapy, and if you do this comparison, you reduce the number of things that you should uh, uh, annotate because in a genome, you are, otherwise you have too many differences. But if you follow the pair from the, of, of, G, of the strains from the same patient during the treatment, this is a good way to discover how it adapts, how it changes during the time. I think this is an, a very, very important instrument we have nowadays to follow the patients during treatment. Yeah, th this is fascinating about how these uh, organisms um, evolve and in, in how we are actually fighting evolution uh, at, at its peak in our patients. Uh, so, uh, Mike, so you, I know you led a, a recent study of sort of a global epidemiology of these pseudomonas infections. Um, and so some of these data you presented before. So, uh, what can you share about the contemporary epidemiology and, 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 and some of the genomic traits of these organisms across the world in, 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 in a study that you led? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I was fortunate enough to, to lead this study, and, and really it was sort of part of a larger study to understand uh, carbapenem-resistant gram-negative bacteria. It was the brainchild, really, of, of David Van Dyne. But particularly for Pseudomonas, um, you know, we want to better understand the clinical and molecular epidemiology in different areas around the world, because if you can understand that, then maybe you can come up with or design um, studies that can uh, evaluate interventions. And so uh, in this study, we, we uh, uh, had uh, uh, carbapenem resistant, we enrolled patients who uh, had, uh, from whom carbapenem resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa was isolated. And uh, in different areas of the world, we had over 40 hospitals, 
and we enrolled in a year. And just to show you how big of a problem <laughs> carbapenem resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa is, we hit like our enrollment target much more quickly than we thought. Within a year, we had actually enrolled over 1,400 patients. Um, so it just kind of shows you, which was much quicker than with Klebsiella or Acinetobacter. So, but, um, uh, uh, so we, we got clinical data. We got the isolates so that they could be sequenced and uh, kind of standardized susceptibility testing could be done. And uh, really, the, the, the first question we wanted to ask was the role of carbapenemases in carbapenem-resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa. And, you know, it's, it's different than Enterobacterales, where, you know, carbapenemases have really driven the expansion of CRE. Whereas with pseudomonas aeruginosa, it's very different because you have this one mechanism, you know, these OPRD mutants that's really unique to, uh, to that uh, causes carbapenem resistance, but it doesn't necessarily cause resistance to piptazo and cefepime and ceftazidime, uh, uh, where, because carbapenems are the only molecules really that use that porin to get in through the outer membrane. So the situation is different, and we wanted to know, you know, how frequently among our carbapenem-resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa are we seeing carbapenemases? And the answer is it really depended. It depended on where you were in the world. So in the U.S., almost all, none of our carbapenem-resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa had a carbapenemase. It was only 2%. But in the studies uh, that uh, from the isolates from South America, it was 69%. And in other areas, it was somewhere in between. But you could see how the geography really has such an important uh, uh, implications for the mechanisms of resistance that we're seeing. Um, and it turns out, you know, we wanted to know, well, okay, not just which, uh, where were we seeing the carbapenemases, but what carbapenemases, which ones. And, you know, it turns out that also differed depending on where you were in the world. In the U.S., almost none had carbapenemases. In South America, particularly Colombia, we saw a lot of KPCs, VIMs. There were isolates that produced both KPC and VIM, whereas in other areas of the world, you know, such as the Middle East, we saw more VIM and GES. In Australia and Singapore, particularly Singapore, we saw more imps and NDMs. So really, the uh, uh, the types of carbapenemases depended on where you know the patient uh, was. The next question we wanted to ask was really, um, you know, are these isolates that have carbapenemases are they different in some way than the isolates without carbapenemases? And it turns out that the isolates that had carbapenemases were much more resistant to meropenem. So almost all of them had a meropenem MICs of 64 or higher. Whereas the isolates that were carbapenem resistant but didn't have a carbapenemase, presumably primarily through mutations in OPRD and maybe some efflux, those isolates were much less, they were still meropenem resistant, that's why I'm in this study, but the MICs were lower, 1632 range. And I think that might have important uh, implications for treatment. The other thing is that the carbapenemase producers were essentially resistant to all of the traditional anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam drugs like piptazo, cefepime, ceftaz. Whereas many of the carbapenem-resistant pseudomonas originosa, like in the U.S., that didn't have a carbapenemase, still tested susceptible to those drugs. So that's a really important difference when you're coming up with treatment options for your patients. And uh, the other thing we, we wanted to uh, investigate was, were the carbapenemase producers associated with worse outcomes? And um, you might hypothesize that they might be because they're more resistant to meropenem, more resistant to other antibiotics, including newer agents, which we'll talk about later. And it turns out that the mortality was almost double in the carbapenemase producers versus the non-carbapenemase producers. Uh, last thing I think we wanted to, uh, the last main finding I think we found from the study was that, you know, with Klebsiella pneumonia, you had a single clone or a signal sequence type that really sort of dominated. And as Dr. Caratoli knows in Italy, KPC became really common. But it was mostly within a sequence type 258 or closely related clones. With carbapenem-resistant pseudomonas, there were many. It was such a diverse array of, uh, of, of, of backbones uh, of the organism. You know, there wasn't one single clone that sort of dominated it. And so it's a different challenge for us to tackle. Yeah, beautiful um, results. And I want to ask, uh, and I, was, I had the opportunity to be involved in this, in this work um, and some of the work that has been done in my country, Colombia. And I wanted to always ask Alessandra, um, so we know, for example, in Colombia, the dissemination of KPC was dramatic. So in a in a very promiscuous way, uh, mm -hmm. that, that 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 got not only in Enterobacterales but also into Pseudomonas. In fact, uh, uh, Colombia was one of the first countries where KPC was reported in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So tell us about the, this 
plasmid or ele genetic element promiscuity. I mean, I think this is a very interesting phenomenon and why that happens. And so the audience understand that you sometimes we have gene epidemics rather than organism epidemics. Yes, and uh, you should imagine that bacteria doesn't uh, uh, doesn't know sex if uh, they have these elements that induce the, the, the conjugation, the, the, the exchange. They can be normally uh, dividing uh, by the normal cell division, and instead the presence of these uh, uh, conjugative elements made them to exchange. And uh, normally, if you have uh, uh, plasmids that move to pseudomonas, we consider this a big, big change because uh, um, the enterobacteria has their own plasmids and very few are able to uh, uh, replicate and to be transmitted in a broader, strange way and uh, infecting also pseudomonas cells. But there are some plasmids that are able to do that. There are some uh, uh, elements that can go from uh, enterobacteria to um, pseudomonas. And in fact, we assist, this is a typical of plasmid that are uh, able to do both conjugation and then replication once they are entered, because they, they, the replication of a plasmid is sustained by the machinery of the, the, of, the, of the bacterium. So the DNA polymerase, the promoters, all is managed by bacterium. So if you arrive with a too far a sequence that is not common in that in that system, it doesn't replicate, it doesn't go on in this uh, uh, infection. And very often, in fact, the unstable plasmids uh, can integrate into the chromosome. So the piece of the mobile element that was important for the selection can move into the chromosome and there the plasmid can also disappear, it is not any more relevant. And for this reason, I think uh, um, some of these uh, uh, contaminations from uh, enterobacteria jumping into, uh, into pseudomonas can happen where um, these genes are very frequently reported in other organisms and in an hospital, they can meet both pseudomonas and Klebsiella, for instance. And so in our countries where it's so uh, we are at the endemicity level of uh, KPC production for uh, in, in, in many different uh, hospitals, uh, and, and this is more frequent than the jump into a different species or in a different genera. So um, I'm not surprised that uh, that we see this, uh, but this is uh, this is unfrequent. I mean, still uh, there are few cases described. Of, uh, of acquisition of calvavenemesis genes. And I would like to say that to, to my God, that uh, there is a difference in the uh, pouring uh, permeability to the different uh, uh, calvavenemesis. So it's a question of permeability, mostly the resistance. And so when you have the beta lactamase, the calvavenemase, and it is if, um, uh, able to neutralize all the, the carbapenems. When the, the problem is the pouring and the, per, the permeability, there is a selection probably of uh, different permeability, different affinities for these, uh, uh, these channels. And therefore, it could explain to you why you have differential uh, uh, MICs for the different uh, beta lactams, because not all of them passes the channel with the same efficiency, with the same uh, activity. So it could be one explanation for this differential MICs. Beta, uh, carbavenemase likes uh, to, to kill all, all uh, carbavenemase uh, in no selection. Yeah, this is, this is very interesting. And I, I want to hear the, your opinion. This is probably a difficult question, but I would like you to speculate so as, as, um, as Mike said, you know, in, in the United States, we still very rarely see carbapenemases in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, despite a very heavy use of carbapenems, and plenty of carbapenemases, carbapenemase genes around. And as you know, here in Houston, for example, we have not only 258, but 307 also in Klebsiella pneumonia, Boring. In Colombia, you know, which also a very similar thing, you know, mostly carbapenemases have penetrated Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, 
uh, and that's the main mechanism. So, uh, what, why do you think that is? I mean, any any hypothesis why this massive geographic difference? On, on, on phenotype in two countries that I don't think, and there is a plenty of interaction and we've shown plenty of interaction of, of things that come from one country to another. We have also a uh, few uh, KPC contamination in Pseudomonas, uh, despite we are full of KPC. I think it depends by the plasma type, because uh, in Colombia, if I remember well, you are endemic for a, a, a broadest range of plasmid with a good uh, efficiency of, of uh, conjugation, which was different from with KPC2, if I don't, if I am not wrong. And instead there are others that are more uh, um, uh, uh, stable in one species, like Eclipsiella, for instance. They do not really uh, colonize other species. They are not so good in doing this uh, job. Um, if I remember, uh, the, in the south of, uh, or in the South America, there are more ink and other ink types that have a broad ostrange activities. Ink P also, which is very frequently from Gypsonomas. And so maybe it depends by the vector, because as everything, it depends by the susceptibility to the vector, because uh, they do not fly they are exchanged. So it probably, I, it, from a microbiological point of view. The other point of view could be the coexistence of both infections at high levels in, in the same uh, world. And so it's a problem of transmission. Th that implies, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Alessandra, that the gene has some sort of geographic preference too. Yes, the KPC2 is in a place, the KPC3 is in another place of the, of the globe. That's the best. Uh, I wonder this. That's the best explanation I've I've heard because obviously sorting through the pop data, this question always comes up, right? Like New York City, Rome, a lot of KPC, but much less KPC pseudomonas. Whereas in Bogota, you know, KPC pseudomonas is rampant. Um, yeah, I mean, you could expect you could speculate also, you know, the fitness in certain genetic lineages that are predominant. Could, could that be, uh, you know, there's, this is a fascinating question that I hope we answer at some point. But this could be true if you have the prevalence of an iris clone of pseudomonas in these places. In that case, yes, I can tell you, there is probably a colonization, the spread of a clone. But it doesn't seem uh, a problem of clonality, a function of one clone. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't fit so well with the, with the model. Yeah. And this, the model. This is... It's, it's just to speculate because who, who knows? I don't yeah, know. exactly. But uh, <laughs> I, I would love to speculate in this podcast because that, that brings a lot of ideas uh, with us to yeah. get back to the lab on our patients. Fantastic. So let's move on. Let, let's talk about now uh, therapy, you know, uh, and, and that's a very important uh, uh, topic. Uh, and let's start with Mike about, um, so what, what you know, there are there is good, sort of the pipeline has sort of reinvigorated a little bit, um, including drugs that now are available for multidrug resistant pseudomonas. So tell us uh, for uh, mostly clinicians listening to this, what are now options for treatment for, for this multidrug resistant uh, pseudomonas? Yeah, so I think these new antibiotics are game changers and, uh, you know, I call them the four horsemen. So you got uh, the first one is Septolazane Tazobactam. The second, ceftazidine maybe Bactam. The third is uh, imipenemrela Bactam. And then you have Cefiterocol. And, uh, you know, these are such important therapies for our patients uh, because previously when we had pseudomonas that was resistant to carbapenems and kind of our traditional anti-pseudomonal beta-lactams, we really just had polymyxins and aminoglycosides and, you know, occasionally fluoroquinolones. And that was it. And we, we've now learned that you know, polymyxins are not only, you know, toxic, but they're also relatively ineffective. We know aminoglycosides are also toxic and relatively, infection, relatively ineffective, particularly for certain types of infections like pneumonia. So we were really, you know, didn't have a lot of options for our patients. Now we have more options. Um, now, among those four drugs, um, you know, I think here, you know, certainly in the U.S., and this is where the carbapenemases come into play, but septolazane tazobactam, I think, is a major workhorse. And, you know, I think you could think of septolazane, tazobactam, and ceftazidine, maybe bactam as somewhat similar. 
they come at the problem essentially of how do you deal with these Pseudomonas aeruginosa that produce a lot of AMC beta lactamase. And in Pseudomonas, it's called PDC or Pseudomonas derived cephalosporinase. And so with the ceftolazine, that's the novelty. The tazobactam doesn't add anything for Pseudomonas. But the ceftolazine essentially takes tef- ceftazidine, looks like ceftazidine on the left side of the molecule, and on the right side of the molecule, it's, it differs from ceftazidine, and it doesn't allow AMC beta lactamase to hydrolyze as well the beta lactam ring. So it makes it much more stable against these PDCs, and that's why it has this activity. Whereas Kazabi kind of t- took a similar approach but said, well, we're not going to modify the ceftazidine. We're going to add a potent AMC beta lactamase inhibitor in AV Bactam, which is why I think the two compounds have relatively similar spectrum of activity, and they also have similar weaknesses. So how do you get resistance in pseudomonas to these drugs? It's primarily from one of two mechanisms. One is you get a carbapenemase, okay, and that can hydrolyze both compounds. Obviously, KPC may be protected somewhat with the AV Bactam but will certainly hydrolyze the septolazane tazobactam. When you get metallobeta-lactamases, it hydrolyzes both of them. So that's a big weakness. The second weakness are mutations in this PDC. So there are certain mutations that then are now able to hybridize in the AMC beta-lactamase that then allow it to hydrolyze septolazane and don't allow EV bactam to inhibit the beta-lactamase that well. So those two occupy a special part, I think, in our armamentarium. Okay. Then you go to Mike, yeah. Sorry, go sorry to interrupt there. Uh, I just want uh, Alessandro to comment about this AMC regulation um, because I, we, we, you talk about this, and this is very important for what Mike is explaining. Um, so, so what's the deal of AMCs or the PDC in pseudomonas, uh, Alessandro? AMC, uh, as many other gram max, uh, pseudomonas has its own uh, intrinsic gene. Uh, that is a class C beta lactamase. Normally, it works on penicillins and has no particular features. But there are two key points for MC. One is the activation of transcription, so production of MC. And the second, unfortunately, mutations occur in MC because uh, this gene is uh, uh, flexible uh, to accept mutations, even very closely to the pocket um, enzymes. And in this case, I see that there are some mutations that are conferring specific resistance and avoiding also the inhibition by inhibitors. So keftalozolatazobactam, keftalozolibactam can be um, can be um, uh, metabolized by these new variants of MC that are appearing un- uh, under treatment. And uh, combined with the activation uh, of expression, so an overproduction of expression and mutations that are selected during therapy, and there are two different loops uh, that can be impaired by mutations. One is uh, around 147, I mean, close to the uh, to the pocket um, uh, of the activity, another more distant, and since that the effect of mutation in the two um, in the two loops are more or less uh, resulting in uh, resistant variants that, uh, that are more resistant than the beginning, than the beginning of the, the therapy. So it's a big problem. The, the evolution of variants, especially w- when the gene is intrinsic, it's a big problem because you cannot stop that. You cannot stop the selection. You cannot stop the mutation. So uh, it accumulates. And uh, yeah, Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. I wanted to highlight that particular point. And Mike, would you say, for example, between ceftazine and septolazone, maybe ceftolazone permeates a little bit better and that has a little bit of advantage in, in, in that setting? Yeah, I think perhaps. I mean, I think the activity is relatively similar. I think an argument for reserving ceftolazine for pseudomonas is that ceftazidine, maybe Bactam, already has a special place in our armamentarium meat because that AV Bactam can inhibit KPC beta lactamase. So it's really important for our carbapenem resistant Klebsiella's, for example. So for me, at least, that's probably the biggest reason why I prefer ceftolazine to ceftazidine, maybe Bactam. Uh, but yes, I think there are probably some more subtle uh, uh, advantages to it. But I think all this highlights that there's no magic bullets with pseudomonas, you know, and we need more and every, you know, it, it's amazing to me that these new compounds have come out and yet we're already seeing, and which is great because for many of our patients, you know, you have a much better option 
than you know giving a polymyxin or an aminoglycoside. And so I, I can't stress that enough. And yet we're still we're, almost immediately we started seeing strains that were resistant to some of these newer agents, and sometimes not in ways that we anticipated. You know, like Pseudomonas is full of full of surprises. Um, and so it's um, it, I think it just highlights how many options we need for this bug. So you were going to comment on the other drugs that you mentioned. Um, so particularly um, imipenem, relibactam, and cefiderocol. Can, can you comment yeah. about those two drugs? So when I first started learning about imipenem, relibactam, I mean, I thought it was just being developed because of the relibactam can inhibit KPC. And so I, you know, I was like, well, this would be a great drug for, you know, Klebsiella, et cetera. Uh, but what I didn't realize, and I think imipenem, relibactam taught me a little bit of maybe about the biology that was going on that I didn't even realize. You know, we're sort of taught in medical school that carbapenems are completely stable to AMPC beta lactamases. And so why would, if that were the case, then why would adding the relibactam, which can inhibit AMPC, improve the activity of the imipenem in the absence of a carbapenemase? And yet it clearly does. And I think what this taught me, at least, is that, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Caratoli said, not all carbapenems are equal. So imipenem is hydrolyzed to a significant degree by the pseudomonas-derived cephalosporinate, maybe a little bit less than, say, miropenem. And so by adding the relibactam, you actually restore activity in many imipenem-resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa. So this is you know, something that, 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 that I learned. And the other interesting feature, I would say, is that some of these PDC mutations that confer resistance to septolazane tazobactam, resistance to cazabi, they actually make uh, the bug less likely to hydrolyze imipenem. So sometimes you can have strains that have become septolazane tazobactam resistance that test susceptible to imipenem relibactam. In fact, I think in one study, up to 40% of our septolazane tazobactam resistant pseudomonas that don't have a carbapenemase, that's a different ballgame, but we're retained susceptibility. So in my own practice, you know, thankfully we have now have, we can use, utilize all these drugs that are available at our hospital. So when I have a, although I like septolazane tazobactam, when I have a patient who has a new pseudomonas infection that's recurred and has had heavy prior exposure to septolazane tazobactam, I think about using imipenem relibactam in that setting. So, uh, Alessandro, one thing about imipenem relibactam that I, uh, I've asked, and many people have asked me as well, is uh, the concern about this, uh, this uh, pouring mutation, particularly to the penetration of imipenem. Um, but when you look at this data clinically and in vitro, uh, um, even those mutants that were long time characterized don't seem to matter that much. Um, and so do you have any comments about that? Um, not really. I don't know this uh, in particular this literature in Pseudomonas, but I can tell you that uh, for sure there are in uh, in enterobacteria there are some differences between imipenem permeability and uh, meropenem permeability and the other scalpapenems are selectively selectively passes the diffusion points. So in, in this case, we are probably talking of affinity with, for the specialized channel of PRD for the different uh, drugs. In general, I can say that um, antibiotics that have, or beta-lactams that have uh, um, low affinity for uh, the, uh, the porins, uh, uh, they also have high, MIC, a high level of uh, uh, minimal inhibitory concentration, and vice versa, uh, beta-lactams that have uh, um, high affinity for, uh, for the points can be also trans transferred more, more easily. And so this is a, a bit of, uh, there is also probably a, a question of, uh, you know, of modification of the, of the, of the PBR, P, of the penicillin binding product for this. Could be the flux. There could be a particular difference in the flux because there are some uh, the differences also um, for uh, affinity for the for the exportation of the drug for the for the not only the uptake but also the exportation of the drug. So there are so many factors. I, we 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 still need to discriminate every mechanism system which is more important, which is the most important mechanism that is in, impacting on that. Um, I would like to ask if you 
observe this difference between open and and uh, Kazavi resistance because in Klebsiella this is very uh, well established now that the mutations conferring uh, uh, the best uh, uh, Kazavi resistance have lost the, the possibility to uh, metabolize uh, carbapenem. So there is this, this difficult decision probably within the bacterial cell which is the best enzyme uh, in, under the therapy and so uh, the selection acts uh, for the two. And I don't know, you, you can feel that when uh, it turns to Keftazinim uh, avibactam, can you use uh, the carbapenems in that, case, in that case, or still uh, you, are, uh, in, you are not confident to use carbapenems? Yeah, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, it's, it's still a different situation than the, you know, the uh, KPC variants. Um, uh, because you have this entry issue with OPRD. So I think, um, you know, although I don't know if I've seen data directly with mirapenem, but at least with imipenem alone, you still need the relibactam. Uh, and uh, so imipenem, you know, these organisms that are septolozane tazobactam resistant typically don't test susceptible to imipenem alone. But when you add the relibactam, some of them test susceptible. And to me, it just highlights the fascinating nature of this bug. Like, it's not just one thing. It has to be a combination of factors. And I, and I believe if you look at the old studies where OPRD was knocked out, if you just have OPRD, you know, there are other ways carbapenems can get in. Because if you just knock out OPRD, you don't, conf you know, you increase MICs 8, 16 fold, but you don't, you know, that may not confer frank resistance. You need other, you need, you know, AMPC beta lactamase. You need a little bit of efflux. Yeah. And so it's this, you know, you really, it, like one, you know, Pseudomonas has so many ways to confer resistance, and we haven't even talked about carbapenemases, um, that uh, it, it's kind of what sets this bug apart a little bit uh, from, say, Klebsiella's and, you know, the problems we've been dealing with that are primarily carbapenemase focused. Mike, I noticed, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Alessandra, uh, I just wanted to follow up quickly. Um, um, I noticed that you did not mention meropenem vibrobactam as an anti pseudomonal agent. Could you explain uh, why that is? Yeah, vibrobactam doesn't seem to add much to meropenem. Uh, and part of it may be that meropenem is just much is more stable against the MC beta lactamases. Uh, uh, and, uh, but the vibrobactam, unlike adding relibactam to imipenem, which makes a big difference, Adding the Weber Bactam to Miropenem doesn't seem to add that much. You know, I think Weber Bactam is really a kind of a designer drug for a specific resistance mechanism, and that's KPC. But, um, you know, and I don't know the data about how well the Weber Bactam inhibits Pseudomonas derived cephalosporinase compared to, um, compared to Rela Bactam. But certainly in vitro, you don't get much more bang for your buck when adding. In fact, you may see differences in percent susceptible. But that's primarily due to differences in the breakpoints because miropenem vibrobactam is dosed differently than miropenem. You have much more drug you give. You give it over a longer period of time. Uh, and um, But it doesn't seem to add too much. That's why I don't kind of see it in the realm of our – It shouldn't. I don't think it should be in our anti-pseudomonal arsenal. Definitely in our anti-KPC Klebs arsenal, but not, not for this. Alessandra, you were going to say something? Yes, I was I noted that I said the affinity for OPRD. That was I, I was mentioning affinity for the P uh, penicillin by nucleotide uh, three because uh, there is a difference. Of course, the porin has uh, its own uh, uh, relevance, but among the mechanisms that can make a difference could be affinity for the for the target and of course the flux and as we say multiple mechanism corresponding to the final phenotype is not so easy to understand sometimes. Okay. Great. Let's let's talk about the, the the sort of last drug you mentioned, cefiderocol and pseudomonas. So uh, this is an interesting drug. Uh, so what, what do you think about uh, the, the, the utility of cefiderocol in pseudomonas? Yeah, so uh, cefiderocol has a really a unique mechanism of action and um, I think its big advantage in the clinic is it retains activity against a lot of the carbapenemase producing pseudomonas, including metallobetalactamases. And, uh, you know, just for background, essentially this is ceftazidine with uh, additional equipment 
that allow it to be a siderophore, including a catechol, which actually binds to iron. And this allows this uh, drug to take advantage of actor and iron uptake. And so the bacteria are fighting with us, you know, for iron. And so it's been called a Trojan horse, similar to what you may remember in the Peloponnesian War. But really then at the end of the day, you get high levels of this cephalosporin um, in the periplasmic space. And because of the catechol moiety, it is more stable to degradation by carbapenemesis, which is a big advantage. Um, so for example, it generally has activity against, you know, our metallobeta-lactamase producing pseudomonas, whereas those organisms are typically going to be resistant to Toltaz, Cazavi, Imirel. So it has a lot of potential. The problem is, are twofold that I see. One is that we still don't have a lot of clinical data. And in the only randomized trial for carbapenem-resistant organisms, this drug, for whatever reason, maybe, I don't know why, didn't perform as well as you might expect. Um, in fact, the outcomes with Pseudomonas in particular were similar than what we saw with best available therapy, which was often polymyxin-based. With Acinetobacter, when you threw that into the mix, you actually saw increased mortality. So that is a small study. There could be other reasons for this mortality imbalance, but that was a little bit concerning. And then the second is the testing. The testing is really challenging with cephidericol. You have to use special media that is depleted of iron. If you use standard Mueller, Hint, and Auger, you don't get results that correlate with in vivo efficacy. So those pose two potential challenges. And for that reason, in my own practice, I sort of reserve cephidericol for essentially our metallic, when we rarely, you know, we, I see these organisms rarely, but certainly when you have organisms that are resistant to these other agents or you have metallobeta-lactamase producing organisms, um, um, I, I think it's, it, it's a reasonable option. And it may be a more important option in areas where they see a lot of metallobeta-lactamase producing pseudomonas aeruginosa because we really have a paucity of agents for that. Okay. Um, comments, final comments on this, uh, uh, Alessandra? I, I read uh, these um, mutations in uh, the TOM B receptor that could uh, impair the importation of iron. And of course, I'm scared that bacteria can find this way to avoid the importation of uh, cephidrocol. But uh, I also believe that this kind of bacteria will have a very bad fitness because they need iron. And so this mutation, yes, can give a, a temporary um, advantage under selection, but I don't think they, they will pay the, with fitness uh, loss this mutation. So I hope that it works, it will work. Yeah, so uh, and we do we do have a, a lot of interesting data on on that particular mutation that seems to be much more common than initially thought uh, with cefiderocol. And I am the one of believer that maybe that drug alone may not be ideal at the moment uh, when you have a very sick patient. This has been a fascinating conversation. So let, let's let's wrap it up. So Mike, what what do you think is going to be the future of treatment of these drugs in the next five years? Of these organisms? Well, one, one thing I haven't mentioned I think is really important, and I won't get too in-depth in it, but I want to make sure the point is made, is I do think these drugs should be given as prolonged infusions, um, or sometimes, uh, you know, uh, and many of the new drugs are being developed that way, to be given over, you know, two, three hours. Um, and I think it's really important to optimize the PKPD of these drugs so that we can maximize their activity, decrease the emergence of resistance, um, I think that there will, uh, hopefully, we'll have more studies done to understand how to better use the four new agents that we have. Um, and I think there, there will be new drugs. And, uh, you know, there's some very promising beta-lactamase inhibitors, tanabrobactam, others uh, that can inhibit, um, you know, not only class A, C, D, but also class B, you know, our metallobeta-lactamases. And we welcome that. We're not, you know, we're not, we shouldn't be satisfied. Pseudomonas is you know, going to keep punching back and, and we have to keep, keep up our, our fight. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, prolonged infusions, learning how to better use the drugs we have, and then welcoming new antibiotics, particularly those that have activity against our metallobeta-lactamase producers. I, th I think that's what we'll see in the next five years. I'm going to give Alessandro the last word. Any final remarks? 
uh, it's better to avoid infections than to cure them in this particular <laughs> in this particular bug is particularly true so it's, it would be better to avoid infections and because sometimes you cannot cure them but uh, with these uh, new drugs I am really um, excited because there are uh, they are thought for inhibiting specific mechanisms. So I can say, being a molecular microbiologist, that the discovery of the resistant mechanism helped the science to, de to design new drugs. Not new drugs in general, but new drugs against what we have already uh, known. So we knew KPC and Avibactam is, is against it. We knew the, the metallo, now we are building um, um, inhibitors for the metallobetalactamases. So the discovery of the resistant mechanism anticipate the discovery of new drugs that are not uh, random, but are specifically targeting that mechanism. So I think these two sciences, the pharmacology and the, and the antimicrobial resistant investigation are both necessary. So we continue to study, to imagine even, which can be the, the next invention that the bacteria uh, do. And with this, I think we cannot anticipate the resistance, but we, we can uh, probably help the design of new drugs, new combinations and using drugs. We are really learning a lot on how to combine them, uh, which is the best uh, beta lactams for, for uh, that purposes. For, but it's uh, also, now you are thinking, and this is incredible for me, uh, that the clinicians are thinking to the mechanism of resistance they have. And this is a progression for a microbiologist. I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a good point that, that now you are considering the mechanism of resistance before uh, assigning the therapy. This is uh, great. An amen to that. And with that, I'm going to close. Thank you very much for this fascinating conversation. Lots of things to learn and, and research. I really appreciate your collaboration. Thank you for uh, participating in our Editors in Conversation podcast. This is Cesar Arias, Editor-in-Chief of AAC, signing off.